Well, if you guys are taking notes, which I hope you are, and you have your Bible, but if you don't have a Bible, I'm going to have some of our leaders pass it out. So just raise your hand if you need a Bible today because we want you to be able to have one with us. We are going to be looking at another character in the Old Testament and their road trip, and his name is Jonah. Not not that Jonah, another Jonah, another Jonah. (laughs) So if you guys want to turn to Jonah chapter 1 with me and just put a bookmark there, that is where we're going to be at today. And if you are taking notes, whether it's on your phone, on the notes app, or if you have a notebook, we're going to title this, Which Way Are You Running? That is the title of our message today. Which way are you running? It does. It does. While you're finding that, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, guys, okay? Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for this beautiful day. I thank you for the miracle of waking us up, Lord, that we often take for granted. I thank you for every single one of these students that you have placed here, Lord, that you came before us, God. And I just pray um, that you just open our hearts and our minds to something that you have to tell us today, God. And I thank you so much for you being here and for your love that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I have a question for you guys, and I just want you to raise your hand, just raise your hand. If you have ever been on a trip, and you ended up going one way, and maybe got lost along the way, or perhaps you went the long way around, has anyone ever accidentally done that before? Oh, good. Oh, (laughs) Jayla's laughing. I wanted this trip. Oh, blame your sister. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'm glad I'm not alone in that. I'm going to share you guys this story of a trip one time that I took with my family, and we tried to get one place, and we definitely got lost along the way. Now, this trip, it's known in our family as the death hike story, okay? Yes, we barely survived it. Now, when I was younger... Our family used to go camping all the time. It's like one of my favorite childhood memories. And we went, fa- we went camping with my mom's side of the family. And something about my mom's side of the family is they are very, I don't want to say crazy because that sounds bad. We're going to go with adventurous, spontaneous people, okay, and overly confident. And so we're at this campsite, and my Theo is like, hey, I really want us to go on this hike. And it's going to be so beautiful, a nice little loop around, and then we'll end up back at our campsite. And I'm like, sure, that sounds good. So me, my cousins, my dad, my sister, we all start going on this hike. And we're walking, and it's great. It's like early in the morning still, okay? We're like, oh, we'll be back in like two hours. So we start hiking, and then all of a sudden, we get to these like barbed wire fences, right? And any normal person would be like, oh, we should not go across a barbed wire fence. But of course, my Theo is so confident. He's like, oh no, that's where we have to go. So then my dad's tossing my sister under, I'm crawling over, and then we keep on hiking, right? We think this is totally normal. We're following, we're following. And then it's starting to get later in the day, right? And now I'm starting to get tired. And as a kid, Maybe two hours seems like forever, right? And it's getting hot. Now the sun is like rising. It's getting hot. And we only all brought like one bottle of Gatorade with us, okay? So we're hiking, we're hiking. I finish. I go through my bottle of Gatorade first. And I look to my cousin. I'm like, Giovanni, do you want to share me just like some Gatorade? And you know what? This kid has the audacity to say. He looks at me and goes, oh, you have cooties, Alexis. I can't share with you. I'm like, cooties? We're family. What the heck? So I'm like, fine. So I share with my sister. We keep going. It's getting super hot. We're hiking. We're hiking. And then all of a sudden, my tia like, starts crying. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what is happening? We turn around and she has blisters like all over her shoulders. I kid you not. Because it is so hot and she is like literally burning, right? And then... We're, I turned to my Theo and I said, do you even know where you're taking us? And now he has to, the audacity to be like, actually, we've been lost for a few hours, guys, and I have no idea where we're going. And this should have been a nice little simple hike, like little loop-de-loop all the way around, then we end up back at our campsite, right? And so now we're at this point where we're like, okay, we're running out of Gatorade. My Theo literally has blisters on her. We got to find the barbed wire friends and get back. So now we're starting to like run back. We're trying to get back to the campsite. We're trying to find it. We eventually find the barbed wire fence. We toss my sister over. I go under. We're running out of Gatorade. And then we get to this point at the end of the hike where we're like, we only have one Gatorade bottle left. And we're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This is my thought as a kid, okay? And... 
Now, from we went from, oh no, I can't share because you have cooties, to all of a sudden, we're all one sip at a time. You take one sip, you take one sip, you take one sip, right? We make it through, we finally get to the campsite, and it is dark at this, okay? I may be exaggerating, but I feel like we were gone all day long. And it's dark, and my mom is like freaking out. She's like, oh my gosh, I almost called the like park rangers on you guys, because I thought you were lost. And then we're sitting here in this campfire, and we're retelling the story like we just survived this like Mount Everest like hike, right? Which is probably just a few hours, but it felt like forever. And so my family, it should have been this nice, easy journey, right? We go one spot, we know exactly where we're going, and then we make our way back. Yet, it was this whole thing that we thought we were gonna die, right? And we got lost, we took the long way around, but we eventually made it there. And we're looking at Jonah, right? God tells Jonah, hey, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah's like, ooh, I'm gonna go the long way around. And Jonah's gonna get a little lost along the way but eventually he's gonna get to the spot that God needs him to be at. So I want us to kind of look, and we're gonna read through Jonah chapter one of his journey of eventually getting to the spot where he needs to go. So go ahead and follow. We're gonna be in verse one here. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. And if you're taking notes, we're going to have four main points today. This is our first main point. The devil can still create opportunities for you in life. Not every open door is a door that you are supposed to walk through. And I feel like this is a very Christianese saying of, oh, you God opened the door for me, God opened the door for me. But not every open door is something that you should be walking through. You look here at Jonah, and I think I have a map. Can I have a map up? David. I think I have it up here. Oh, perfect. Right? Jonah is right here, and he just needs a short little trip to Nineveh because that is where God wanted him to go. And instead, what so happened to be waiting for Jonah is a ship that is gonna take him the farthest away from Nineveh possible, right? And you look at that and you see that in scripture here that this open door, this opportunity took Jonah farther away from the Lord. The devil can open up and create these opportunities for you. Not every open door is a door that you should be walking through. But that can also be a scary thing because then you find yourself asking, well, how do I know if I should walk through that open door, right? And these are three things that when I was thinking about this and praying about this, of stuff that I feel like helps us discern whether we should walk through that open door or not. The first one is to write down your prayers and ask the Lord what you should do. And I think it's really cool when you physically write down your prayers because then you can actually see God when he answers those prayers, whether it's the way you want it to or not, but he will answer them. And for myself, I have this little like prayer board in my room and I write down all my prayers that I'm praying for every single morning. And then some of my prayers, they get answered in like a week. And then I put them on the back and some of my prayers, have been there for over three years and I still wake up every day and I pray for those people and those things. And so I think it's really cool though because then when I feel like I'm in this spot where I forget all that the Lord has done, I turn over that prayer board and I get a look at the goodness of God and the way that he has answered all those prayers. So I would say that's our first one. Write down your prayers, ask God what you should do. The second thing is I want you to, and I challenge you to invite people into that space with you. Um, to have friends to be like, hey, I need you to pray for me. I don't know if I should do this or if I should go here. Can you help me with this? And if you're like, man, I don't know if I have those people in my life. Well, I also want to tell you guys that there's a lot of really cool leaders here that would love to be that space for you. To be able to go to a leader and say, hey, I really need someone to help pray with me over this. Or what do you think about this? Can I have some godly advice and wisdom? You have all these people in this room here that love you, that want to be able to pray with you and fight the battles with you. 
And then my last thing is you got to read his word. The more that you read God's word, the more you learn about the character of God and how God talks. And I think that then you will always be in situations where you're like Jonah and there's a ship waiting for you and you have to decide, hey, am I going to get on this ship and and go through this open door or am I not? And these are some things that can kind of help you decide um, what to do. So we're going to go ahead and continue reading in verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the car- that cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the sea, or into the inner part of the ship, and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And this is my point number two. Who's in your boat matters. Who are the people that you are surrounding yourself with matters, right? Look here in Jonah, or yeah, in Jonah. He was not supposed to be in that boat, right? And this ship is sinking. The sailors are freaking out. They're desperately crying out to any God who will give them just a thought because Jonah was not supposed to be on that boat. And so that's my question to you. Who is in your boat? Are these people bringing you closer to Jesus or are they causing you to sink? Now, we're still gonna see that God is going to use Jonah being on that boat for a really cool moment But Jonah should not have been on that boat to begin with, right? He should have been going straight to Nineveh where God told him to go. Let's continue in verse 7. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told him. And this is my third point. No matter what we do, no matter where we go, we cannot flee from the presence of the Lord. And I love this Psalm, it's Psalm 139, which I believe I have up. And David writes this, and I want us to kind of read it together. It says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me, right? David is saying, no matter where you go, you cannot run from the presence of the Lord. And that is so true for us today, right? Whether you are going home to a house, to a room where you feel lonely or isolated, God is like, don't you worry, I'm right there with you. Or maybe you're struggling to make friends and you're like, gosh, this is like the hardest thing to do. And God is like, hey, like, I want to be your friend and I'm like right there with you. And it does not matter if you are in this place where you feel so stuck, where you feel like no one sees you and God is like looking right at you and he's like, I see you and I love you and I'm right there with you. And that phrase, the presence of the Lord is mentioned three times in those 10 verses. And Jonah is physically trying to run away from the presence of the Lord and he cannot right? And I want that to be a comfort when you're, when you're in this like struggle or this place and you're like, man, God, like I don't have no one in life. I don't have no friends. I don't have no people. And the Lord is like, hey, I'll be your person and I'll be there with you. And there's nothing you can do that'll ever push me away from that. And God is there with you. And I think that that is so cool. We're going to go ahead and pick up in verse 11. Um, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more violent. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then because of me, uh, wait, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. 
Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more violent against them. Which I think is so funny because Jonah is telling them, like, hey, this is what you need to do for this to stop. And they still try to do it their way. They're like, nah, we're going to just keep rowing harder and harder. And look where it got them, right? They still could not get anywhere. And how many times do we do that too? God's like, hey, maybe you should do this or your friends or things like that. And we're like, no, we're going to do it my way. And then you keep trying over and over again. And you're like, I can't quite get here. But eventually, right, you see in verse 14, they do what Jonah tells them. He says, therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it is pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. So immediately it stopped. The storm that was about to break their ship up stopped. Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And this brings us to our last point, which is even in Jonah's disobedience, God still used it for the sailors to be saved. And what I think is so cool about this story is you look in verse five, right? The sailors are desperately crying out to any God that would just give them a thought to save them. They are so desperate for someone to save them. And Jonah has been here a lot this entire time with the one thing that these sailors are looking for, which is the hope and the knowledge of God. And how many of us have people so desperate in our life that need something, that want something to help them get through these hard struggles and these trials because they will come, right? And you have the one thing that you can give to these people and that's the hope and the knowledge of the gospel. And whether you have heard the gospel before or you haven't, it's this truth that is so simple, but I don't want us to overlook it. And sometimes we hear it all the time and we're like, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. But like, do you guys know what that means? Like I was sitting with this all day this morning and I was asking God, like, God, like what is one thing that I just really want everyone to know? And I want us to be reminded of what the gospel is, that God chose to send his son. He did not have to, okay? But he chose to send his son to die this death he did not deserve, to be beaten, to be tortured, to be humiliated, so that you get a chance to spend eternity with him. And that's because God looked at every single one of you and said, I do not want to spend eternity in all of heaven without you in it. And what I think is so sweet about this is there's this like lyric from a worship song and it says, you did not want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. And God looks at you and is like, I don't want to spend all of eternity without you. And sometimes I try to like sit and grasp this concept of eternity. And sometimes it's scary and it's hard because I can't understand this idea of forever and, and this concept of time, right? But just imagine the Lord is like, man, I'm going to do this thing so that you have a choice that you can spend all of eternity with me in a place that you get to experience all of my goodness, all of my love, in a place where there's no more pain, there's no more tears, there's no more suffering, there's no more crying. We were never to ex- we were never supposed to experience this stuff here. But because of sin, we do. And I don't know about you, but I can't even imagine a place where I don't cry, because I cry a lot, okay? And I can't imagine a place where there's no more pain and there's no more suffering, because I've seen a lot of it in the people's lives that I love. And the Lord is like, I have prepared this place for you and I want you with me. So I'm going to send Jesus to make sure that you have this this choice so that you can choose me and you can spend all of eternity with me. And I think that is the sweetest thing ever. And let's say that this story stopped with Jonah chapter 1. And Jonah never went to Nineveh. Everything that he went through being tossed overboard, swallowed by the fish, all of these things was for these men to be saved, for these men to have a chance to know God. Because these men's souls were worth it to God. Just how he looks at every single one of you and is like, you are worth it to me. And I know that it's hard sometimes when you are going through suffering 
to see that anything good can come out of it. But I want you to imagine that while you are suffering, if one person gets to know Jesus and then gets to spend all of eternity with God up there in heaven, just partying up dancing, wouldn't that suffering be worth it? And I know that we all are gonna go through this. Whether it's gonna be now or later in your life, there's gonna be a time that you're gonna go through suffering or hard things. And I want you to think, man, God, how can you use this so people get to spend all of eternity with you? Because you have a very cool gift that the Lord has given you if you choose to accept it. And that's to spend this entire eternity with him, just dancing and praising and worshiping. And I think that's a really cool thing. And if you look in the rest of Jonah, and you want, I'll challenge you to read the next few chapters throughout this week. You'll see that God commands Jonah, Jonah gets swallowed by this fish, God commands Jonah, um, or commands the fish to spit out Jonah right where he needed him to be. So Jonah will still find himself in Nineveh, he will still find himself preaching repentance and grace and mercy. Jonah could not outrun God's plan for his life, and that is the same for every single one of you. You cannot outrun God's plan for your life. So my question to you is, which way are you running? Are you going to be running with God, or are you going to be running away from God? Okay, let's go ahead and pray, guys. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, so much for today. I thank you for these students that you have purposely brought here, God, to be able to hear the gospel message and to be reminded that we get to spend all of eternity with you. And I thank you so much for your love and for your grace and for just knowing us and seeing us and that no matter where we can go, that, there, that you are always there, Lord, and we cannot flee from your presence. And I pray that you just have, that we all have fruitful conversations um, in our small groups, and I thank you for this night. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.